Hello, very good evening to you and uh, uh, Happy New Year. I almost forgot that bit. We've not been here for a few weeks. We've had a, a good uh, Christmas and New Year sabbatical on the show. I hope you've had a great holiday and that you're ready for more of these Thursday evening chats with uh, sporting personalities, with people of interest throughout the region when it comes to sporting activities. And we've got a couple of guys here tonight, extremely athletic, putting me a little bit uh, to shame post-Christmas. One of them is a guy I've known for, uh, I've had the pleasure, I should say, of knowing for many years, uh, going back to when I was on Radio Hallam working with a guy called David Hayward, an athletics expert. I've already apologised to my guest tonight that my athletics knowledge doesn't match David's, but I'm delighted to welcome Peter Elliott, MBE. Now, do you know, believe it or not, there are people of a certain age who, who've, who've never, incredibly, never heard of you. It kind of dates you and it, it dates me. Is that This guy was a superstar of his time. Thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I fully appreciate that, especially the youngsters and obviously working in the environment I, I do. I think it comes as quite a surprise when, you know, the old guy in the office is an Olympic silver medalist and they're not quite, they weren't aware of that. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was good while it lasted. Well, look, it's continuing to last because Peter performs a, a very important role at the English Institute of Sport. He's based uh, at their facilities here in Sheffield, but it spreads wider than that. We'll talk on this show about that, but also, of course, about your glorious athletics career. Just to remind those who don't know, I mean, ask your dad or even your granddad, uh, but he, your kids have never heard of you. Yeah, that's what you told me. Well, yeah, yeah. They've never heard of you either. Yeah. <laughs> they know now, but I think in the early days they were a little bit surprised you know because it wasn't something that we, we shouted from the rooftops look you're, you're one of the most humble down-to-earth modest sports stars I, I've ever met and I've got to say I was I put that on Twitter before I even <laughs> you even came in here 1500 meter silver medalist at the Seoul Olympic Games in 1988 also a silver in the year before the 1987 World Championships again. That was 800 meters. The previous mm -hmm. one at the Olympics was uh, the following one in the Olympics was 1500 meters. But also in 1990 at the Commonwealth Games, 1500 a gold medal. A yep. very distinguished career, and we're going to talk in some depth about that. We are going to relive the final two laps of okay. your silver medal run okay. in Seoul. Uh, yep. That'll be in part two, um, and talk about your current role, but. It was such an incredible era of athletics in terms of who you were competing against in that time, Peter. It, it was, and you know, if you if you look back to for those who are old enough to uh, to be able to look back, remember that. But you think of Moscow in 1980 and the Corvette battles. Uh, there were two giants of, of sport without a doubt and uh, those races uh, brought the country to a standstill and everybody watched them and as a young as a young 17 year old middle distance runner that's who you wanted to emulate uh, and I had the the honor and the privilege to compete against those guys uh, and eventually I, I managed to uh, start beating them as well so yeah. uh, but they were the role models when you stood on the start line in Britain uh, you knew uh, if you wanted to be the best in Britain you've got to be the best in the world because you had Cole, you had Ove, and then obviously you had a, a young Steve Cram as a young pretender coming through and, and pushing those. So we had such depth, and there was myself, Tom McKean, uh, and a whole host of, of other athletes and talent at that time. So uh, success breeds success. And in this area in particular, it was such an exciting time because of your proximity to Sebco. He's in Sheffield, you're in, in Rotherham. Yeah. Very different backgrounds, yeah. but both competing at the top at the same time. And, and it's interesting because out of the two, the Cole and Ovet, I, I was an Ovet fan. Uh, and uh, and the, the reason for that was uh, I, as a 16-year-old kid, I went down to Merthyr Morn on the sand dunes with uh, Harry Wilson, who was Steve Ovet's coach, invited down there. And Steve Ovet came along and this one Saturday morning and engaged with us, and I, I became a fan. Uh, but I always used to start the season off with the Yorkshire Championships because I believe there was a grassroots, and I did that because Seb always did that as, as, as well uh, but as I said two greats uh, of the track who really 
you know, put no, Britain on the map, middle distance running, and, and raise the bar so high, and, and the level of expectation on, on the rest coming through was extremely high. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you still run, by the way? I do a little bit of running, uh, just ticking over, uh, but I've uh, turned to the bike now, so as most of the, the, the chaps I go out cycling, we're all former runners who got dodgy knees, dodgy bikes, yeah. or dodgy something, so, uh, but uh, yeah, a lot of time on the bike, but I still like to do a little bit of running just to, uh, to, to keep the weight to a certain level. Well, you look very trim to me. But yeah. your, your actual peak running weight was incredibly slight for a man of your height, five yeah. foot ten. You were under ten stone weight. I was at the Olympics when I, in, in Seoul. I was about nine twelve. An average weight would be about ten two, ten five yeah. in the winter. You just put a little bit on, but uh, but yeah. So uh, I'm probably around about well twelve stone these days, which you know is. Uh, yeah, yeah. When I look at some of the some of the runners, even you know from the Rotherham Harriers and that, they're still they're still sly. But uh, I, I'm doing okay. Yeah, talking about Rotherham, not just Rotherham Harriers, but Rotherham United, yeah. a great love of your life. And uh, we will talk about what you think of the Millers now. They're also in silver medal position, they like are. you, second uh, in League One, but. That was your first love, wasn't it, growing up, football? Football was, yes. Uh, that's, that's all I ever wanted to do. Uh, you know, at primary school, uh, at secondary school, I had no interest whatsoever in, in running. Uh, it had never come to my attention at all. I just wanted to run, and uh, Romash Comprehensive School was where I went, and uh, they were just building a new sports hall. The, the, the old one had been flattened. So if the football pitches were waterlogged, you had to run cross-country. And it was a, a first and second year uh, in all money. Uh, yeah. P lesson and I was the first one back and uh, Mr. Sheard, our PE teacher, uh, said that uh, I was running for the school on the following Thursday because there was a series of cross-country races and I, I told him uh, quite quite bluntly that I wasn't interested and he, he informed me that if I didn't run for the school on Thursday I wasn't playing football for the school on right. Saturday <laughs> and the rest is history. Indeed. What position did you play football? I was wing, right oh, wing. Ah, I'm yeah. not surprised yeah. then. Yeah. No, not surprised. Yeah. Yeah, jet-heeled winger. Yeah. 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 Someone once a day, you know, Rotherham United. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hakib Adalakan, I think that's how you okay. pronounce his name, on loan from Bristol City. Oh, right. That's great news. He's quick, yeah. he's quick footed, uh, very talented, uh, and I think available for Saturday. Well, I look forward yeah. to, uh, to seeing loan. how he does. Yeah, he's a, he's a decent player, yeah. believe me. I've seen him a, a few times. So where are we? What, what, what's the say? Because things go through cycles, and that was a golden era that mm. you were involved in. Do you, do you, I'll ask you in a minute where you think we are now with athletics, but do you ever look back and regret that um, there was perhaps less competition at your distances than there was? I mean, it was a furnace heat of competition that you took on there. Mm. I think I, I I do get asked the question, you know, you know, you came along in the in the wrong era, mm. and I said no, I didn't. I came around in the in the right era because obviously to be associated with Colve and Cram is, is is an honour to be to be perfectly honest. And as I said, I, I think because when we stood on the start line to be the best in in the world, you had to be the best in Britain, and so that brought us all on. Um, and you know, we've had. I also think that from a, a media perspective, I I, I thought that they. They probably thought the well would never run dry and mm. we had a few barren years and I, I used to coach a, a talented athlete called John Malk, one of yes. the most student games in Sheffield, yes. talented and we've had people from come Barnes. through yeah. from Barnsley and there's been others come through over the years, uh, Curtis Robb uh, from, from Liverpool and play, people like that. But it's great to see this year we had three men in the World Championship 1500 metre final and that's been a, the first time for a long time and uh, so hopefully the fact that we have those three they will bring others on. Yeah. Uh, extremely talented young man in Halifax called Max Bergen. Uh, yeah. Looking at his times, uh, young guy, 18, extremely talented. So you know, I have high hopes for him coming through. So you know, and uh, and and the women in the middle distance runners are doing well. But uh, you know, hopefully, it's a, re a renaissance. Yeah. Did we get quite the kick on from your era with the Crams, the Ovets, Coes, and yourself that you would have anticipated? Probably, probably not. As I say, you know, obviously you could throw Tom McKean in there. You know, yeah. very, very talented 800 meter runner from from Scotland. Uh, but as I said, you know, there was like uh, Matt Yates came through, but then there was John Mayo. John Mayo was around the same time as Anthony Whiteman, and they used to have a yeah. lot of battles. And we've had we've had others like come through, but 
Unfortunately, there has been a level of expectation on, on mm. those young guys uh, coming through because obviously Cohen Ovet dominated the world. Cram came along, set world records, won world titles. I came along and got, got some medals and, and got an indoor world record. So there was always a level of expectation. Uh, but I also think that it's become more and more difficult as well in the fact that when I stood on, on a start line at Olympic Games or World Championships, there was three Kenyans in the race and there'd probably be three Ethiopians. Now you could have six Kenyans because mm. there's three running for Kenya and the ones that aren't quite good enough to make a Kenyan team, they could be running for some yeah. other team now. So it's become a lot more difficult from that perspective as yeah, well. It's just a great race for racing, isn't it? Yeah. It's natural. Yeah. It is, and, and you know, I, I always tune into the, the 800, and, and particularly the men's 1500, and you know, I still get the butterflies in, in the tummy when it comes to the, yeah. the final of a world or an Olympic 1500 meter, especially if there's a Briton in there. So right. it still, uh, yeah, it still has fond memories. Yeah, uh, coming back to it, but you mentioned you've into cycling, a little bit of yep. cycling yep. To, to, to keep fit and to keep the shape that you are. Just to say that in. Uh, Part two, we'll have another special guest. Let's just introduce the guy briefly now. I'm James Kemp, I'm 51 years old, and I made a decision about five years ago that uh, if Sheffield United got back in the Premier League, I would cycle to every away match of the season. Um, at the time when I promised that, I didn't think it would happen, but um, Chris Wilde had made it happen and his team, so uh, good to my promise. I'm doing this uh, for the Children's Hospital in Sheffield, trying to raise as much as I can uh, and let's see where it takes us. That's James Kemp and where it's taken him this evening. I don't know whether he's really got time. He's going to be here in uh, part two talking to Peter and myself. <laughs> he's still got the energy to make trips other than cycling so I've got a list of games that he's been to and he's covered over 1500 it's miles incredible. cycling to the, these games yeah. uh, James Kemp. Uh, raising money for Sheffield Children's Hospital, yeah, so yeah. we'll have some meeting later. I'm yeah. sure you, you all uh, admire us. I, I do admire because I, I know I, you know, I go out and probably do two and a half miles and uh, two and a half hours, sorry, not two and a half miles, two and a half yeah. hours on a bike. So to do some of the journeys, because you know the Brighton is four hours drive on a good mm. run in a car, so uh, yeah. to be doing that, but also raising the money for such a worthy cause. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll hear more from uh, from James. Tell me, do you enjoy running, or did you enjoy running? Uh, yeah, I did. To be honest, uh, I, I did enjoy. Uh, I have to say, there was a lot of uh, a lot of the training sessions I did, the intervals on the trike, uh, which were extremely painful, and uh, yeah. you know, I was uh, quite ill at times at the side of the track from from the, the, the exertion that you put in. Uh, and when you get to the race, they always say, you know, train uh, train hard, race easy, and that's what you should be doing, really, because uh, you, you never, even though obviously you're racing, you, you never see somebody go over the line in, in kind of the kind of state that you would if you'd done intervals on a track at yeah. uh, you know a certain pace. But yeah, I did. I enjoyed running. I enjoyed the long runs on a on a on a Sunday morning, uh, especially if you were running with with uh, your friends as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was it was a it was a big part of my life, and uh, it still is to a, a far lesser extent. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily follow because you're good at something that you enjoy it, but it's nice to know that you enjoyed most of it. I think like half marathon is humble ones mm -hmm. like like me. It's all about the the yeah. day, I not think, about the training, because I don't enjoy yeah. the training. You know. No, I think, I think, you know, but on the other side of that, there was always a pressure as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go into a start line, there's a level of expectation, uh, and, you know, because it was such a high profile event and the media attention was in particular high, uh, mm -hmm. so there, there was elements at times which w weren't great from that point of view, but uh, I had a lot of support uh, from the people of the town in Rotherham. I had a lot of support from the guys I worked with in the factories in Sheffield when I was out there, uh, which I I always appreciated so from that point was of view. Was the media glare perhaps, and this is perhaps unusual uh, when you get saturation of say football, mm. the sport that your other sporting love, that the media glare was harsher then and the interest more acute than it is now? I think I think it was and I, 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 I see a big difference obviously from a track and field point of view you, know, you look at the profile and I don't particularly think the profile is as high as it used to be because you know, in the days when you know you go to the 80s and 90s, uh, BBC took majority of the races. Yeah. So the Stockholm's, the Grand Prix in Oslo, yeah. the Dream Mile in Oslo, you know, half past ten in, in all the pubs, you know, yeah. where, wherever. Uh, and now it's kind of gone to to Eurosport and Sky yeah. and that, so it's, it's harder to find. Uh, so you know, the attention and there's I don't think there's there's many column inches 
in the, in the press is what they, they want. Uh, there was why, do one think, time. why do you think that is? I'm not too sure. I, I, I think just the other sports are obviously taking over. I think if you also look back, you know, uh, in the 90s, uh, you could line up uh, 10 of the British team uh, in Meadow Hall on a Saturday, have pull a thousand people, and I would imagine 990 of them would know who, who they yeah. were because there was such depth. So you'd have Linford in the 100, John Reeves in the 2, Colin in the 110 hurdles, Roger Black in the in the 4, Tom McKean or myself or Cram or Cohen over in the 8 and the 15, and, and, it, and it went on. And you got Steve Backley and Jonathan Edwards, and there was such depth across the whole range of the sport. Yeah. And we, we don't have that, obviously. You know, we had Mo, you've got, uh, we had Jess, and Jess, obviously yeah. Greg Rutherford, Super Saturday, and, and now obviously Dean Rasher Smith and uh, mm. Katrina Johnson Thompson coming through. And uh, as I say, we, we, you know, we just need that, uh, that new generation to come through and, and start doing it and get, uh, get the profile a little bit higher. Is, is sport generally, not just athletics, selling out to the great god money? You'd get the same debate about cricket, it's not available widely. Terrestrial, mm. football's becoming ever more splintered, you know, streamed here, streamed there satellite TV there and it's almost as if the sport is saying well we'll just take the highest bidder and never mind how many people are, are watching. Yeah well that's, you know f for me you still get obviously the major championships are filmed by the BBC and the BBC do, do, it, and do the a Olympics, great job in the Olympics yeah. and, and, and all those major championships are filmed by them. You have the highlights shown on a, on a Saturday when you can catch up on what's happened in Europe in, in, in the week so at least you know there is there is that mm. uh, but it, it's just I guess you know the sports do go you know go to the highest bidder. It's uh, money talks. Yeah, talking about money talks, it was such a different era in your day that mm. you know any top athlete now is is full time, yeah. sponsored to the yeah. hilt and everything. You you were at the height of your career, winning these medals. Why do you got a full time job as a joiner at British Steel? Yeah, to some extent, part of that was a choice. Uh, was it? Yeah, and after I won the World Championships in 87, I, I came back to British Steel and uh, the, it was going to be the Olympics. And actually, the, the bosses of British Steel offered me the, a full 12 months off with pay to go mm. to the Olympic Games and, and train, compete for the Olympics. And I, I very much appreciated that, that generosity, uh, but I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the role I had. I enjoyed the company of the people I worked with. Uh, I liked taking a raw material and creating something from it. Uh, but it also gave me discipline. I had to get out of bed at a certain time and train. I go and do my four hours at work in the afternoon, and then when I came home, I trained again. So I had discipline. Mm -hmm. I tried being a uh, full-time athlete for two years, and, and it just wasn't for me. Yeah. For some, it is. Strange. For me, it wasn't. I, I always needed something else. It was yeah. like going going to work was kind of like a, a paid hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, and I insisted that when I was work, I got paid for when I was at work. When I wasn't there, when I was obviously competing, then I, I shouldn't be paid because I was I was earning money from running as well. So, yeah. Uh, but it worked for me. It wouldn't work for everybody, yeah. and I think that's what you have to do. You find out what works for you. And today it is very different. I work at the English Institute of Sport. We provide all the science and medicine to all the athletes who go to the uh, to the Olympics and the Paralympic Games. Uh, and so no stone is left unturned for those athletes. And they get what's called a, a, an athlete personal award, so they'll get, they'll get some money as well. Do you to wish you'd been there during your career? Uh, yeah, but you know, I have to say I, I had an excellent physio in, in, in Debbie Horn who worked at Rotherham Hospital, so I was from that. I had excellent coaches. But uh, yeah, it's just it's the ease these days of how things can be done. So as an example, if an athlete was to tear the hamstring on the track uh, in, in, indoors at the Ice Sheffield, they would come into our centre, so they would have 20 metres mm -hmm. to walk. They'd probably see a doctor and a physio. An assessment would be done. If they needed a scan, a scan would be ordered. They'd probably have the scan the next day. Mm -hmm. The results would come through, and then a programme would be put around. That's yeah. the difference. You know, obviously, you go by to and if you wanted an MRI scan, you might have had to wait six weeks. So yeah. everything is far more... It's, it's at a faster, faster rate these days. Yeah. You're most British still, and their generosity, but also you were good for them. You were something of a standard bearer for them. You were reflecting on them, weren't you? A, a lot of media yeah. attention yeah. and publicity. Yeah. Well, it worked both I, ways, to be honest. Yeah. Alan, it worked both ways. And as I said, they were, they were very good. And, you know, I, I had free reign to, to come in and, and and, and I could come in and do my job, but then I could go away. And if I needed to go to Australia, New Zealand for six weeks in January, February, then I was free to do so if I wanted to go and compete. So it worked both ways. The attention you created, I mean, we're coming to the end of part one now, but I'll perhaps ask you to recall the, 
receptions you had back in mm. Rotherham following your various exploits. I remember one in particular that was spine tingling, you know, the amount of people that there, turned out to welcome you. Yeah, th there was a lot. I remember I remember well, the first time. We'll hold it because okay. it's 10 seconds of the break. Right. I'm really sorry. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry to stop him in full flow. And don't forget James Kemp, the Super Blades biker in part two as well. Join us in five.